we need, if you think about, if you look in our culture today, and you talk, you, and you think, and you see people and their relationships, and how they interact, and how they have relationships with one another. There's a, a relationship of a, like a, a boyfriend and girlfriend, or a husband and wife, or there's a relationship between uh, family members, a, a parent and their children, or family members and their other family members. And you see, you, you talk about friends having relationships, you talk about acquaintances, you talk about um, all these different types of relationships. And deep down inside, folks love to be able to have um, a relationship with someone, or in a relationship where they're in, be, be a part of um, being able to interact with someone, and being able to talk with someone, and being able to spend time with someone, be able to do something with them. And you, you see it in the media, you see it in movies, and it's, it's in our very core, because that's the way God created us. It's in the very social part of us, that, that social being in us that God has created, so that we can have relationships with one another. And if you look at it, if you look in the book of Genesis, God created us so that we can have, in other words, a relationship with whom? With Him. So God created us for relationship with with one another, but ultimately with Him. And, and we also think about it in your own life. Think about the relationships that you have had in your own life. And think about how you interacted with one another. And you think about how you, um, you, uh, you've done these relationships and how you've um, had these relationships and some have been close and some have not been so close. And then in the relationships that you've had, you've had to maybe talk with some of your friends. You had to maybe speak some things to your friends or your relationships, those you had. Sometimes they may have had difficult words, but because you had a close relationship, they were able to receive those. Sometimes you had to warn people about things, hey, something's coming. And so you had, to, uh, you had to share some of those warnings in those relationships. But that was all part of a close relationship. It was not only speaking the truth, but there was also speaking warning and encouragement uh, along the way. This morning, we're gonna, as we look at, um, we're going to look at um, the Apostle Paul and his relationship with the Ephesians and how he encouraged them, how he um, challenged them, but also how he uh, warned them of the things that were going to happen. And they had a very close relationship. And we're going to see how that all played out and how that all panned out. And we're looking at Acts chapter 20. And we're going to be looking at verses um, 16 through 38. And we're moving along here in Acts. And Paul is on his way back to Jerusalem. And Paul's mindset is that God told him he needs to go to Jerusalem. And so he's on his way back. And so he stops on his way, as we're going to find out, um, to meet with his friends uh, the, the elders at the Ephesian church. Um, but we're going to look at three specific points. Number one is the elders, uh, the relationship, um, I testify to you, and then be on guard for yourselves. So our first point, Acts uh, 20, um, and this is where we're looking at verses 17 and 18, and verses 36 and 38. Um, the elders and the relationship. Look at 17 and 18. Paul calls him the elders of the church, and they come to him. So, apparently, Paul has had a relationship with these elders. Paul has spent some time in Ephesus, and Paul, remember, Paul's on his way back to Jerusalem. He's going there with the mindset that God told him he needed to go, and he needed to get there in a hurry. We saw last week, if possible, before Pentecost, Back in those days, you couldn't take a flight and get there within a matter of a couple hours. This would take some days, weeks, or even a, a, a month or more. You had to travel by ship, by land, and walking. And so the reality was is that Paul wanted to get to Jerusalem, but he also wanted to see who? The elders in Ephesus. Because, again, he had had a relationship with them, a relationship that was close relationship that was intimate, one that he could trust those who he could trust and those who he's poured his life into. Well, let's go on there. 
It says, let's look at verse, um, verses 36 um, here. It says, after speaking with them, he kneels down and prays with them. And think about that. After speaking with them, and we're going to get into what he spoke to them about, but this is after he's all done with his speech, what does he do? He gets them all together, and what does he do? He prays with them. And I know that as a leader, when you're able to pray with other people, there's a certain closeness, there's a certain intimacy that you can have with those other individuals when you pray with them together. Because who are you praying to? You're coming together where? Um, why? To come to pray to God. Come to pray to Him, but you're coming together as one. And so there's a certain closeness there. And so Paul had this closeness and this affinity with the elders of Ephesus. And so the first thing that he does after he gets done with his speech is he does what? He kneels down and he prays with them. That's the first sign of closeness. Number two, it's that you look at verses... 37 and 38. What, what did they, how did they respond after he, they pray? It says, verse 37, it says, they began to weep aloud. It was like loud crying, loud wailing, loud, it was like loud sobbing. Was it, was it because he, Paul hurt them? Absolutely not. It comes from a sadness for their friend, the Apostle Paul. It was a, a deep sorrow in their hearts, because they're, as we're going to find out, they're not going to see Paul again. Paul loved them so much that he took time out of his journey to stop in Miletus and to call the elders of the church over so they so he can have time with them before he goes on to Jerusalem, because he knew that would be the last time they saw him. And now that he he's with them and they pray with them, what do they start doing? They start crying. They start weeping greatly. And it goes on here. And not only did they, um, they weep them, but they embraced Paul. In other words, they give these old, big old bear hugs. And they embraced them as a sign of affection. You know, a sign of, wow, this is great. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, like, with, like with my brother. I have a brother that's out in California. I have my brother, Sean. And him and I, growing up, were fairly close. We're not as close as we were growing up. But we're, we're fairly, we're, we're close right now. He lives out in California. And he's lived out there since he's probably 20-something years old. So, um, and every time he comes home, when he comes back this way, um, what is, what's the first thing he does to me? He gives me a big old bear hug. He gives me a big old bear hug, and that he, um, he does that, and he does with and he said, and he could, and, 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 but that's the way I can imagine these elders giving Paul a big old hug. He's crying, they're weeping, they're sad, and he gives him a big old hug. But then it goes on and says, here, it says, and they repeatedly kissed him. In that culture, it's not that they were effeminate. It's not, that was the way that that culture did. It would be a kiss in the cheek. If you look at Europeans, they would, if you greet them, they would give like one kiss on one cheek and then a kiss on the other. It's nothing uh, feminine about that at all. This is the way the culture was. But that was just, they were showing their affection. They were showing that how they were, um, that they were, uh, loved, they loved each other and had a great relationship with each other. And so, and it, it's really important that they had a, a, a closeness that was, there was a spiritual closeness. A, a friendship closeness, a relationship that was really tight, and they were really, they really loved each other deeply. And it says, um, and then, and it says here, it says, and they, um, and they grieving, and then it says that they wouldn't see him face to face. They accompanied him to the ship. It says they were grieving. In other words, they were sad, just like you have grief when you lose someone. Well, what they were doing, they were losing their friend and their leader the Apostle Paul. They knew that they weren't going to see him again. Because once Paul goes to Jerusalem, what's going to happen? He's going to go to Rome from there. And the reality was they're never ever going to see him again. Could you imagine someone that you're close with and you have a relationship with and you know that you're not going to see that person again? 
Imagine how you feel. Imagine how what goes on inside your heart. So there was a fond affection here, and there was a grieving, saying, wow, I'm not going to see Paul again. And this is just an encouragement. If you think about in your relationships with people, how many relationships in our lives can we count in our lives that we can say we have a relationship like that? Where there was a genuine fondness, there was a genuine affection, there was a genuine caring, a genuine closeness for yourself and the other per person, or the people, or group of people. And there was a, there was a great love there, and so, um, and, and, I, and that part of what um, I would, you know, I was just thinking about is that there's not many of those types of relationships that we have in our lives. But the, for those we had, and you imagine it, that's the type of relationship that God wants us to have with one another. It's those close, intimate relationships as believers. More than just an acquaintance, but even those close relationships. And that's really important to have. Well, let's go on here. Um, our second point is uh, we're going to be looking at Acts 20, verses 17. Uh, B, that's the second part of 17, uh, through verse 27. I testify to you. So now that these elders, he's called these elders, and they've come to him. And now Paul wants to talk to them, and Paul's going to share with them the very things that he, he feels that he wants them to hear, but he feels that they need to hear. They need to hear that um, deeply and closely in their hearts. Um, and they need to... Uh, and they need to have um, that, um, they need to hear these things because he, Paul's not going to be there anymore. And they need to hear these things so they can carry on the very things that Paul has done with them. And it goes on here, it says in verse 18, it says, you, uh, 17, it says, You yourselves know from the first day I was with you the whole time. You yourselves know from the first day. So Paul, you see a couple things here, that Paul was with them from the very beginning, from the very first time, for a whole, for that whole time that he was with them, he was there every day. From the very first day that, this, that the gospel came in there, I, Paul said, I was with you. I was right there. I was in the trenches. I was in the mud. I was in the things. I was right there every day with you. So you know, it wasn't like I wasn't there. I was there. I was right there with you from the very beginning. Serving the Lord, verse Verse 19 says, serving the Lord with all humility, with tears and with trials. It says, I was with you through thick and thin. I was with you through the good times. I was with you through the difficult times. And I was serving you in all humility. I wasn't haughty. I wasn't holding this up over you. I wasn't being proud or boastful. But I was serving you and I was with you in all humility as a servant. And it says, I didn't shrink back, verse 20 says, from declaring to you, Anything that was profitable, teaching publicly and from house to house. I didn't hold back. In other words, he didn't hold back anything from anything that was profitable. He didn't teach a lot of fluff. He didn't teach a lot of junk. He didn't teach a lot of things that sounded good and that were tickling to the ears. But he, what he said was, what he did was, he preached that which was profitable, that which was um, the truth, that which could help them and build them up and strengthen them, encourage them. He didn't, waste, he didn't waste his time. He didn't mince his word. He spoke the truth. And he spoke that which was going to be helpful for them. And it says, in verse 21, it says, Solemnly testifying, that means declaring, testifying earnestly or repeatedly, to charge to both Jews and Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he was preaching what he knew to be the truth. And what was that truth, the fundamental truth? Was, gospel, was the gospel of repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the reality was Paul spoke the truth. Good friends will do that. There's a scripture verse where it says, speak the truth and what? in love. So what was Paul doing here? Paul was speaking the truth in love. He, good friends will always tell you the truth. They won't tell you what you want to hear. They'll tell you what you need to hear. Good friend will do that. They won't tell you what you want to hear. They'll tell you what you need to hear. And there's a difference. 
And that's what Paul is doing here. And that's why they were so close. He knew they could trust Paul. He knew that Paul is a straight shooter. They knew that if he was going to tell them something, he knew that it was from the heart. He knew it was right. And that's what good friends will do. That's what makes a close relationship. You can be able to speak the truth from the heart. It goes back and um, it says, um, and now we look at verse 22. It says, and now bound by the Holy Spirit, he's on his way to Jerusalem, not knowing what awaits him. It says, now he's bound by the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit, he uses this picture of bound, meaning like with chains. It's like he can't, the picture is, it's like he's got chains on his feet and on his, on his hands. And he's bound by chains. In other words, he can't move. In other words, he doesn't have really have a, a choice here. I'm bound by the Holy Spirit. What To do what? To go to Jerusalem. In other words, this is something that I can't get away from. This is something I can't, cannot get out of. This is not something that I can't do. I have to do it because the Holy Spirit is, is, is commanding me to do it. And the Holy Spirit is compelling me to do it. And he's, he, he's, bound, he's binding me to do this. I need to do this. But I need to share with you, I need to share with you um, the truth of what, um, of what you need to hear. You need to hear the truth. And he's pouring, Paul's pouring out his heart to them, because he knows he's not going to see them again. It says, not knowing what awaits him in Jerusalem. Except that, in verse 23, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies. In other words, solemnly testify means to warn. That in every city, bonds and afflictions await him. The Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me. In other words, Paul hears from the Holy Spirit. And what's the Holy Spirit testifying to? What's the Holy Spirit? That trials and afflictions await him. So, Paul is telling, bearing his heart, and saying that the Holy Spirit is compelling me. He's telling me I need to go to Jerusalem, but he's also telling me that trials and afflictions are going to come along the way. But I have to do it. If God has told me I need to do it, then I need to do it. And so the reality is, this is something I've shared over and over again um, in, my, in my messages, is that um, the reality is, is that when God speaks, we need to listen and we need to obey. And the truth is, is that God is going to uh, speak to us He's going to share with us some things that may be difficult, things that may be hard to hear, things that maybe we don't think that we can handle, we can do. And we may try and say, well, God, I didn't hear you clearly. I didn't hear you. Or I can't do that. But we have to make a decision in our hearts. And we have to make a decision uh, before God to, um, we have to say, God, I am going to do whatever you want. I'm listening to you, and even if it means difficulties along the way, I'm going to do it. Because I know that you told me to do it, I know that you asked me to do it, and I'm going to follow through with doing it, God, because I know you've asked me to do it. And I will do it, no matter what. And it says, um, uh, and it, as it goes on in verse 24, it says, And I don't consider my life as, of any account as dear to me. In other words, my life to me doesn't really mean that much to me, as much as it really doesn't, I really don't, it doesn't really matter what happens to me. If this is what God wants, if this is what God desires, if this is what God asks of me, then I need to do it. And I think that that's really important in our own relationship with the Lord. If God's asked us to do something, it's not a matter of convenience for us. It's a matter of, okay, God, I'm going to do whatever you want, no matter what it means to me, no matter what happens to me, I know you're going to take care of me, and I know that you're going to do that which you ask me to do. And I know that you're going to accomplish that which you ask me to accomplish. And you're going to, I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. And that you are going to, um, you're going to do these things. And I'm going to do these things for you, God. Um, not because I, I, not because of any obligation, but because I want to. And I, I'm going to love you and serve you with all my heart. Um, and he says this, that I may finish my course, finish the course and, and, and the ministry which was given to him by the Lord Jesus. In other words, my life's no, no count to me, but I'm going to finish that which God has given me to do, the ministry which he's given, given to me from Jesus. So whatever God's called me to do, whatever God's asked me to do, whatever God has 
chosen for me to do as an individual, I am going to do it. And I'm going to accomplish it. And I'm going to fulfill it. And, 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 and purpose to do it with all my heart. And I'm going to uh, accomplish it that Paul may finish the course and the ministry which was given to him from the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, and that's the purpose to be in our own hearts. Is that the ministry that which God has given us to do, the ministry that God called us to do, is to finish whatever God called us to do. And if God has given us a ministry and a work to do, then by golly we need to be determined in our hearts to complete it and to finish it with all of our hearts. And to do whatever God asks us to do. And other brothers and sisters will challenge us to do that. If there's a good friend or a good brother or a good sister, they'll challenge us. Whatever your God's called you to do, well, you need to follow through with that and do whatever God's called you to do. We know what God asks us to do. We know what God's called to do. We need to finish and we need to finish strong. If you ever look at runners in a race and they're running, they don't, they're not going to win the race by just lollygagging around, looking along the sidelines on the end and getting distracted. But they're determined in their hearts that what they're going to do is they're going to give their heart and their motivation and they're going to finish it and they're going to complete it and do it to the best of their ability all the way to the end. And they're going to finish it all the way to the end. And that's really important to know that and to do that. Uh, because if you can do that in your, um, in your walk, in your, rate, in your relationship with God, God will, um, God will honor that. And that's, the, and that's the same mentality that Paul had. Is that Paul, that God will do that um, in a way that's going uh, um, to honor his God because God commanded him to do that. And it says, now... Um, and, and it says in verse 25, it says, Now behold, all of you whom I went out preaching about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. They're no longer going to see them. Now Paul knows that. He knows that they're sad. He knows that they're upset. He knows that you're no longer going to see me. We're no longer going to have this relationship. We're no longer going to have this opportunity to be with each other ever again. And so there's a mutual sadness there. Paul is sad, and the elders at Ephesus are sad. And there's a mutual um, sadness there, but there's a, they know that in order for this to happen, Paul needs to finish what, do what God's called to do, and these elders need to do what God's called them to do, which was to shepherd the church in Ephesus, and to lead the church in Ephesus. It says, um, I testify to you, I'm innocent of the blood of all men. The Lord Paul has spoke the truth. I, I didn't hold back. I gave you the whole truth, everything the truth, and nothing but the truth. And so I'm innocent. You can't say that, well, you didn't tell me. You didn't tell me. You didn't let me know. So Paul said everything that God had told him to say to, this, to the elders and the leaders in Ephesus. It said, didn't shrink back from declaring the whole purpose of God. Verse 27. He spoke everything that God had called him to do. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't mince his words. He didn't say, oh. He didn't sidestep his words. He didn't, he didn't go around his words. But the reality was, he spoke what God had called him to speak. And I think that sometimes we need to do that too in our relationships. We need to speak that truth and not mince our words sometimes. We need to use grace and we need to use love, but sometimes we need to, not sometimes, but all the time we need to speak the truth. Because that's what good friends will do. That's what good relationships will do. We'll be able to speak the truth. And let's look at our, uh, lastly, our third, our third point is, is being on guard, keeping watch. It says, uh, keep your watch, keep, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock. In other words, he was telling them, be on guard. Watch out. What's that idea? What does a shepherd do? A shepherd does what? A shepherd, that's what a, the word pastor comes from. Shepherd is, is, is one who pastors the flock, who care, guards the flock, who cares for the flock. 
I was in Romania um, uh, many years ago. I was doing missionary work there. And I remember this one, we were in this little town in northern Romania. And I remember up in this big field up on the side of the mountain, there was this big old um, uh, sheep pen up there. And it was all sheep inside the sheep pen. And there was a big field around the sheep pen. And there was a little house there where the shepherd lived. And he was responsible for the sheep. And there was wolves up in that area, and there was wood, woods up there, and so there was wood, wolves and other dangerous animals, foxes and so forth, that would come in there and try and get the sheep. And it was the responsibility of the shepherd to protect, what, the sheep, to care for the sheep. Because sheep are innocent, sheep are, um, can, are very vulnerable sometimes. Because a wolf can just sneak under that fence and try and snatch one of those little lambs, and then they're gone. And so the reality is, is that what's Paul doing? He's saying, I'm warning you, I am warning you, that the, um, you got to be on your alert, you got to be aware, you cannot be distracted. You cannot be distracted. Things are going to happen. I'm going. I'm leaving. I'm not going to see you again. But things are going to happen. And it says, um, and it says, uh, for yourselves and for all the flock. In other words, be on guard for you personally. It says in uh, Proverbs 4, 4, it says, above all else, guard your heart for it is a wellspring of life. In other words, you guard your soul. You guard those things that go in. And you guard those things that happen that, uh, so that you yourself don't go astray. So you yourself, and for your flock that God's given you, guard them. Be on, be on your guard. Be careful of the wolves and the foxes that could come around, that could take you, that could take you out, or they could take your flock out. Be aware. Be on guard. Be alert. And it says, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. In other words, the Holy Spirit, who, who made these elders? Who, who provided these elders? The Holy Spirit made them elders over the church in Ephesus. God has placed leaders. God has placed leaders in our midst and over his church. And their responsibility, in this, in this case, um, I'm, I'm a leader here. I'm one of the past, I'm a pastor here at Over Crescent Bible Church. And so I'm responsible as a shepherd to care for God's flock from the wolves. I need to guard myself, but also I need to guard the flock. But also, it's whom the Holy Spirit has appointed. I didn't appoint myself here. God doesn't appoint leaders in the church. I mean, people don't appoint themselves. Who does it? God does it. Through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who appoints the elders. The Holy Spirit is the one who appoints the leaders to watch and care for the people. Because God is the one who knows how, who can shepherd his people. And it goes on here and says, Shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his blood. So he's telling these elders what? Shepherd the church. Because this church here, this body here, is what Jesus, my, uh, what, what Jesus Christ has purchased with his very own blood. So they're precious, they're special, and they're, and they're dear to me. So you dare not, you better not, you better not take them out. You better not uh, just treat them any old way. You better not treat God's people any old way. You better not. Because they were purchased with God's blood. And you better care for them and watch over them and, and shepherd them. And from your own selves, and from um, after his departure, verse 29, it says, Savage wolves will come in among you not sparing the flock. So in other words, he says, after I'm gone, there's going to, be, going to be people that are coming in. Savage wolves. In other words, that's how they describe a person who's a wolf. What does a wolf love to do? The wolf loves to hunt. Because wolves are hungry. What do they want? They want to fill their bellies. And they want to, they want to devour. I've never seen a wolf fly other than in the zoo. I don't want to see one outside of the zoo either. But the reality is that they're vicious animals. 
vicious. And Paul said, there's going to be people that are going to be coming in here that are going to be like wolves from among you, from the, within the body. And they're going to try and do what? They're going to try and devour the flock. And don't think that that can't happen. I've been in churches, believe me, I've been a part of churches for years. And I've seen where that's happened, where people have tried to come in and act like they're super duper Christians and act like they're, they're the most spiritual people in the whole world. And they're really wolves that are trying to take people out. Trying to destroy people. And they're trying to care. And they're trying to destroy God's flock. And they're trying to, and what are they trying to do? Not sparing the flock. From among them, from your own selves, verse 30. Men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples to them. That's their whole purpose. Men will rise. Men will arise. And speaking perverse things to draw them away, disciples to them. So the reality is, is that people will rise within the body. And it can happen. It can happen. Don't think it can, cannot happen. It can happen. Within the body, within the church of Jesus Christ, people will rise. And what they're going to be is, they're going to be wolves in sheep's clothing. Don't think it can happen, because it can happen. It has happened. I've seen it. I've experienced it. And their whole, soul, whole purpose is to draw people away. And what they try and do is they try and steal the sheep. They try and steal the sheep for themselves. I've seen where churches have been divided that way. And where it's hurt, it's hurt people. It's hurt people. And people have been really severely hurt as a result. But part of the responsibility is of the leadership within the church to be aware of the wolves and to be able to recognize the wolves and to be able to deal with the wolves. Because they'll come. They'll come. And that's a part, because the enemy will do that. Because what does the enemy want to do? He wants to come steal, to kill, steal, and destroy. And so he'll send his people in there that appear, that have appear as an angel of light, appear as godly and holy. But in re reality, they have ulterior motives of wanting to destroy and to, and, and to take for themselves. Because that's what a wolf does. doesn't care what he does, but he wants to destroy, to take for himself. So be on the alert. Be on the alert. Be aware. A good soldier, a good leader, a good person, will be aware, will be alert. Remembering that, uh, at verse 31, that night and day for three years I didn't cease to admonish you with tears. So in other words, every day, night and day, Paul spent with these, with these churches, with this church, and with these leaders. Night and day for three years, he warned them, he encouraged them, he challenged them, he didn't hold back from speaking the truth. And he protected them, and he cared for them. Night and day. In other words, he poured his life into them. And so as a result was, they had a close relationship. And Paul could speak the truth to them. And Paul could encourage them. But Paul could also warn them. And they could receive it from him. And I, I remember the reality. I remember that, um, that he said, remember how I was with you. I just want to encourage you. I remember this is some years ago when I was doing. I was on a missionary trip. I was actually for a whole summer with a, with a, another pastor friend that was a pastor now. We were up in northern Canada working among the Canadian um, Canadian uh, natives up there. Yeah. And I remember there was a conference up there, and there was some pastors and some leaders up there, and they were preaching up there. And I remember the message they had. This was. Years and years and years and years ago. This is probably over 30 years ago. I remember them saying that, you know, in the last days there's going to be, um, there's going to be apostasy. I remember that as a young man. I, that was one message I heard. I remember I, I said, people are going to draw people away. People are going to draw people away. The very same message of Paul preached here. That people are going to try and draw people away. It says, guard your heart. Be aware. 
Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Because people are going to come and try and draw you away. I remember that message clear as day. <coughs> and I remember leaders saying, there's going to be leaders that are going to become apostate. And apostate means is that they, they turn away from the faith. And because they, because they weren't fully committed, they weren't fully given over to the Lord. And remember that and what Paul was saying here, he's telling these leaders here, is be on guard. Be on guard, be warned that people are going to come. False leaders are going to come. They're going to try and draw you away. They're going to try and suck you in and try and take you away. And try and draw others away from the faith. And try and draw you unto themselves. And it can happen, not only back then, but it can happen today. And I've seen it where it's happened today. And so the reality is, is that we need to be on our guard. Be alert, folks. Be alert. Especially nowadays with the social media out there. Because there's so much news, and there's so much things going on. And there's so much information going on. that it, Information is real time. And real time meaning that it's happening. You hear it right now as it's happening. And we believe some of that stuff, and some of that stuff we think is true because the so-called experts say it's true, and it's really not true. And it can draw us away and suck us in, and we can believe a lie and think it's the truth. And then we get deceived, and we get pulled away from the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, now I... It says, it says now, verse 32, Now I commend you to the word of His grace. Um, in other words, I commend you to the word of His grace. In other words, I'm giving you, now that I'm going, I'm committing you to the, to the word of God and to His grace through His Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, I'm commending you to the word. I've spoken these things to you. You know about His grace. You know about the words I've spoken. I'm commending you to this so that you need to follow His word. You need to follow and know and understand that it's by the grace of God that you stand. So I'm commending you to these things. Not to myself and what I'm able to do. I'm com commending you to God's word and to his grace. And the reality is, is that um, as you do this, God will, um, God will keep you. And God will help you. And God will help you to do what you need to do. It says, I, co I didn't covet anyone's silver or gold or clothes. I didn't ask for all that. I didn't covet anyone else what everyone else had. You yourselves know with my hands, verse 34 and 35, I minister to my own hands, to my own needs by my own hands, and to the needs of those who are with them. In other words, I took care of myself. I didn't I wasn't a charlatan where I I asked I was always asking for money. I said I worked hard. I worked hard. With these own hands, I worked hard. He was a tent maker by trade. And so he supplemented his income uh, so he could survive and live by doing tent making. And he worked hard, not only just for himself, but also those who were with him. Because um, there was Timothy there, there was Silas, there was Luke there sometimes, and there was others there along the way that were with him, and he helped support them by working hard himself. And that's a part of another quality of a good leader. A good leader will work hard. A good leader will uh, do what they God called them to do. And we as his people, good pe people that follow the Lord and know the Lord, will work hard. They're not going to be, as a, you know, they're not going to be always so dependent on someone else to give them something. But, they, but they'll depend on the Lord. And they'll work hard themselves in order to do what God's called them to do. And accomplish what God's called them to accomplish. And... Um, it says, and then lastly, it says, and everything I showed you of working hard in this matter is to help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus is more blessed to give than to receive. Um, it says, in other words, I've given you, I've given you the, um, this example for myself that as I work hard, so should you, and so that you can accomplish and do what I've called you to do. And what God's called you to do. And not only so you can help yourself, but also help those in need. And what did Jesus say? It's more blessed to give than to receive. In other words, not only just to meet your own needs, but also to help meet the needs of others. 
as well. And so that's so critically important, that, that attitude of being able to not only really meet your own needs, but also the needs of the body. And that's what was primary in Paul's mind. In Paul's uh, eyes was that I needed to not only help me, but help you, the body, and help the needs of others. Um, as we go on here, um, and lastly, it says, God has called us, as I think about this, God's called us to salvation. As believers who have walked with God for many, for any length of time, He's called us to a maturity in our faith with God and towards others in our relationship with them. In other words, God's called us to grow up in our relationships with others. And for our relationships to be honest, to be close, to be real, to be able to speak the truth, to be able to encourage one another, to be able to build up one another, and to be able to be faithful to one another. And it says, um, Paul, was, uh, Paul demonstrated this in his relationship with the Lord and with the elders of the Ephesian church. Paul is mature in his relationship with them. Yet there was a, a mutual fondness and affection for each other. Paul loved them, but also encouraged them and warned them of things to come. Paul was trying to prepare them for what was to come. God had given us relationships within the body, we must learn to develop those close relationships, encourage one another, even warn them if necessary, so that others can be prepared for what God has. So, just as a, as a point, is that we have relationships in our lives. We need to use those relationships to encourage one another, to build up one another. Also to challenge one another, but also to warn one another. Because things are going to come, and things are going to happen. Things will, things are going to happen. But we need to be people that have those genuine relationships. But also, again, be warned. As Paul said, that things are going to happen. People are going to come. We just need to be aware and be able to shepherd the flock of God with all of our heart.